Holly, we're ready to get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to host this event to discuss Jakob Mishangama's incredibly insightful and engaging book on the history of free speech. The shocking war in Ukraine brings many of the themes in his book into stark and urgent relief and will provide interesting context for today's discussion. It further raises the question of whether our so-called free speech and democratic recession may actually be pushing the underlying principles of liberal democracy to a breaking point. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Jakob Mushangama is the founder and director of Justicia, a Copenhagen-based think tank that focuses on human rights, freedom of speech, and the rule of law. And as we know, he's the author of this new wonderful book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. He's also the host of the podcast, Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech, which was a precursor to his book. I really encourage you to check that out if you haven't had a chance. I will put the links in the chat. We're also joined today by Joel Simon, who will interview Jakob. Joel is a fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia Journalism School, and many of you may know him as the former executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Joel also has a book coming out on April 26 from Columbia Global Reports. The book is titled The Infodemic, How Censorship and Lies Made the World Sicker and Less Free. We will be taking questions from the audience today, and you can put that in the Q&A section um, at the appropriate time, Joel will signal to you. And with that, I will let Joel take the floor. Uh, well, Holly, thank you so much, uh, Jakob. It's wonderful to be with you. I've really been looking forward to this. I so uh, enjoyed your book. And, and, and let me describe it briefly. I would call free speech a 400 page treatise that begins in ancient Greece and ends in uh, Silicon Valley. But the reader, including this reader, um, was left not with a sense that the ability to speak freely has, has permeated human history, but rather just how exceedingly fragile and precarious the right is. It, it has really never been truly secure, not in ancient Greece, not in ancient Rome, not in the Ottoman Empire, not in medieval Europe or during the Reformation, not in the American colonies, or post-war post Europe, and certainly not today. The struggle for free speech is constant, it's ongoing. There are hard, hard fought uh, advances and tragic setbacks. And the rarity of free speech in human history, as you've sort of outlined in the book, you know, raises questions for me, which is if the ability to speak freely, to express our most personal thoughts and ideas to reach our own conclusions and to share our experiences is so central to our humanity and the social order. Why has it been so rarely achieved? And that's something I wanna to get to. Um, as a writer, press freedom defender, former executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, I know how valuable free speech is. I fought for it. I've mourned friends who died for it. So uh, Jakob, I obviously agree with many of your arguments and, idea and ideas, but for the sake of ensuring a lively discussion and one that will be engaging to people who are joining us today, I'm going to adopt a somewhat uh, contrarian posture at times and ask you some questions that are really on my mind and I hope that you will indulge me in that exercise. Uh, before we get started, let me uh, thank um, Holly, Sofia Lalinde, Catalina Botero, and the whole uh, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression team. Uh, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression maintains a comprehensive database of leading legal decisions and engages with the global legal community, both to build awareness and also a jurisprudential record to help preserve the essential and threatened right, um, which uh, Jakob so powerfully chronicles uh, in his book. So. Jakob, congratulations again on writing such a compelling and informative book that has been so well received. Um, Holly already uh, introduced you, and so I will, I will skip over that and just jump into my, my first question, which is a somewhat personal one, not that personal, don't, don't be alarmed. Um, but I really was wondering if there's something in your own experience and background, something you know, that's, 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 that's of a personal nature, 
in which you felt your voice was being stifled and you had to fight to be heard. And, and put another way, was there some personal experience that led you to become such an impassioned advocate, defender, and chronicler of free speech? Thank you, Joel, and, and, and also thank you to Columbia Global Freedom of Expression. I uh, have very fond memories of my six months uh, at, at Columbia where I, I wrote the podcast and, and what would, parts of what would later become the book. And, and thanks for that question, Joel. You know, I'm <coughs> in, you know, probably among the luckiest generations that have ever <laughs> lived uh, in, in the world when it comes to free speech, being born and raised in, in cozy liberal secular uh, Denmark. Um, which, you know, by, by, by any objective standard is, is, is one of the countries in the world where, where free speech thrives uh, the best, even if there have been uh, a number of setbacks in, in the past decade or so. Uh, my father, on the other hand, uh, has, has spent time uh, in, in prison uh, for opposing first uh, French colonialism and then an authoritarian uh, government. Uh, and, and ironically, given my my suspicion of, of, of hate speech laws, he uh, um, uh, five or six years ago was arrested uh, for, for protesting uh, the gov some government measures and, and, and was arrested on, on, under hate speech laws in, in the Comoro Islands where, where he's from. But, but so, so there was no sort of, no, no natural or, or good reason why I should be really into the, the whole question of free speech because for most of my life I've been able to take it for granted. But then Denmark in, in 2005 and six became sort of the epicenter of a global battle of values over the relationship between free speech uh, and religion when a Danish newspaper published a number of cartoons depicting the, the, the Muslim prophet Muhammad. And that uh, obviously, as, as, as most people probably know, led to huge controversies that continue to this day. Uh, let's not forget that the reasons why um, a number of journalists and editors were killed at the French satirical magazine, Jali Hebdo, in 2015 was the fact that Charlie Hebdo was one of few outlets, media outlets that actually showed solidarity with, with uh, Yulens Post, the Danish newspaper and, and republished these, these cartoons. And, and, but, but the whole cartoon affair sort of, I think led a lot of people to question, you know, if, why and how free speech was, was really so important. And, and what I found, um, what really piqued my interest was that a lot of people who saw themselves as sort of the modern ears of enlightenment values were suddenly saying, oh, you know, free speech is important, but um, these cartoons are, you know, constitute an attack on a vulnerable minority. It's punching down, it's an abuse uh, of free speech. Whereas they would have been absolutely in favor of, um, of, 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 of someone like Voltaire or others who had criticized the Christian religion as, as part of the of development towards a, a, a secular, uh, liberal, uh, democratic uh, Europe. But then I also saw that a lot of people on the right who were sort of free speech absolutists when it, during the cartoon crisis then suddenly turned around and then uh, when, when a center-right Danish government started uh, introducing a number of laws to restrict the, the, the speech of uh, extremist Muslims, they, they said, oh yes, free speech is important, but in order to save free speech, we need to restrict uh, the, the, the rights of fundamentalist, uh, religious fundamentalists. And, and so to me that, that, that showed this, this, this great paradox that, that free speech um, is rarely protected uh, in a principled manner, and, but, but ultimately depends on a principled defense because otherwise it will be sort of nibbled away at uh, from, 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 from various uh, uh, sites uh, until, the, until the very concept and, and core is hollowed out. Well, let me ask you uh, just about the cartoon controversy since it was, sounds like it was a formative I experience uh, for you. You know, some of the criticism certainly was was about uh, the right to publish, but a lot of some of the, the other criticism was about the judgment. You know, and whether whether it was exercising good judgment. Do you think those two points got conflated? Do you think that you know questioning the judgment is is fair game? It was only the right what the right to publish was was challenged that you uh, thought that a line was passed. How did how did you parse the criticism? which I think was, was um, you know, 
lots of people disagreed. That's completely mm -hmm. different from, from um, uh, you know, uh, suggesting that they don't have the right. Yeah, no, I, you know, I think that every single editorial piece of judgment is is open to debate and 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 and, and yeah. scrutiny, you know, and, uh, and and so if it had just been about that, then then no problem. Uh, but the context of this was a situation where you not only had a number of countries, authoritarian states that use blasphemy laws internally to limit all kinds of dissent who demanded that international human rights law should be changed so that blasphemy basically uh, became a violation uh, of, 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 of human rights, uh, sort of inverting the very principle of free speech. And it was also a context where uh, religious extremists were trying uh, to kill uh, editors and journalists. And, and I would hope mm -hmm. that everyone agrees that even if you think that a, that an editor or a journalist or a cartoonist has exercised poor judgment, uh, they should not be killed or threatened uh, for, for, for doing so. And, you know, initially I myself was of the opinion that the cartoons were sort of poor taste, cheap, gratuitous attempt to provoke. But then, you know, I became friends with the editor Fleming Walser and, and, you know, very few people have read the piece that accompanied the cartoons because, mm -hmm. because it was written in Danish, uh, but it actually sets out a, uh, what I think is a compelling case. It, uh, uh, and, and it basically says that, you know, in a secular liberal democracy, no specific group can demand uh, special protection um, of, of, of their, their feelings, whether it's secular or, or religious. So, so I think it was sort of a, a very uh, compelling uh, argument for a modern day version enlightenment values, but it was not, it was, it, it was perceived by a lot of people to be sort of a racist attack and an attempt to mm -hmm. To, 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 to punch down at, uh, at Muslims who, and that should be included, uh, there had been a ferocious debate about uh, immigration and, and especially Muslim mm -hmm. immigration in Denmark. And there had certainly been uh, a number of voices who, who, uh, who, who said nasty things uh, about Muslims. Well, let me go back then to the, to the, to the point I raised in, in my introductory remarks, which is, you know, this, this is a right that, you and many others, <laughs> Voltaire, is, you know, but but many others that you chronicle in your book perceive as, again, essential to our humanity and at the very core of the political systems that we create, and yet it is always in dispute. It is always fought over. It is never secure. Uh, there's always these, you know, you, and you and, and it's and it's a relative rarity. I mean, you you described this as the, the golden age of free expression, but I mean, I think most. Of your book, when you when you when is 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 a a tale of woe. It's really a you know how how um, rare uh, the moments were in human history where where people lived in an environment where they where, where these rights were protected. Why should that be? Why should such a something that's so essential to who we are and our humanity be under such constant threat? Well, I think free speech is really um, a counterintuitive and very difficult principle for human beings to uh, to handle. I think to a certain extent, we've evolved sort of our, the software that we've evolved and, and we're born with um, tends toward a, a default position of intolerance uh, and, and, and one where we see our survival and the social cohesion of our communities as being threatened by ideas that that clash with the the prevailing values of of, of, of the of the larger community, and then you know through uh, various experiments we've developed this uh, these values of, of tolerance and free speech, but it's a constant fight <clears throat> to 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 um, ensure that our default position doesn't override um, the, uh, the, the patch, if you like, that we've developed in, in, in terms of, of tolerance and free speech. So, so, so in that sense, I, 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 I really think it's, it's difficult for, for human beings. And, and as I show in the book, um, lots of the greatest champions of free speech uh, were themselves had had their limit limits and and their buts and ifs mm -hmm. uh, and and were unwilling to 
to uh, to defend free speech on a more principle uh, from a more principal point of view. You know, in addition to the argument you you, you make about on principles uh, based, you know, for, for principles based defense of, of, of free speech, you also make a sort of pragmatic or utilitarian argument, and the most uh, sort of surprising one you make is about uh, Nazi Germany and the totalitarian temptation chapter, in which you talk about how an understandable desire in the Weimar Republic to, uh, you know, suppress this dangerous speech ended up being appropriated uh, by the Nazis in, when they came to power and used uh, as, a, as a framework for repression, sort of basically backfired on them. And you, and you even argue that um, you know that that uh, you know uh, that that sort of totalitarian uh, and, and and genocidal system under the Nazis was not entirely uh, a function of the speech that the that the that the Nazis were were you know government was engaged in. They were more complex uh, uh, factors. So I wonder if you could summarize that uh, that argument and uh, explain why even in instances where speech is presents a call it a clear and present danger, you know sometimes uh, the actions of government to curtail it uh, actually end up undermining their their goals. Yeah, I think the the issue of the Weimar Republic is is so interesting and and, and fascinating, but also really pertinent to today because. In, in, in Europe, unlike in the US, uh, laws restricting free speech on, 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 on issues like extremism and, and hate speech are very much motivated by a concern that I share, uh, <laughs> that of never again, of, of never, uh, never again experiencing a totalitarian regime culminating in, uh, in in uh, industrial scale genocide uh, as, as, as happened during uh, the Nazis. Uh, and of course, the, 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 you know, the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism is vastly more complicated than sort of, it cannot be explained through the narrow lens of free speech and censorship. But what I try to show is that the Weimar Republic was not this libertarian paradise where Nazis were able to say anything without uh, consequences. Uh, in fact, uh, the media um, was heavily regulated, and, and increasingly draconian emergency laws were were adopted. So, for instance, it, it, we can start with the radio. For instance, so the radio policy of, of the of the Weimar Republic was was such that it was you know um, Nazis and communists were not allowed to 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 broadcast. It was sort of more or less uh, government friendly programming only. Uh, and then in, there were lot, lots of newspapers and, and, and the Weimar Republic was certainly much more permissive when it came to press freedom than what went before it. But um, there were these emergency laws adopted uh, so that governments, uh, state governments could, for instance, administratively ban newspapers for up to eight weeks if they spread false news or attack government institutions uh, or, or in, engage in, in, in extremism. Um, and so you have a person like Goebbels who would, who would become the propaganda minister during the Third Reich. He, he set up the Der Angriff, so, so a pro-Nazi newspaper. And the reason why he set up this newspaper was because Adolf Hitler was banned from speaking in a number of, of German states for a while. Uh, and and uh, and he is the Angriff is frequently banned from publishing, and and Goebbels uses this as a propaganda ploy, sort of to present the Nazis as victims, as martyrs of the uh, of of the illegitimate uh, state um, that they that they are uh, against. Uh, the same with uh, with Julius Streicher, who was the most depraved anti-Semitic Nazi of, of them all, and, and the editor of Der Stürmer, uh, he is numerous, frequently hauled in, into court, and, and he's also convicted for a religious offense due to these blood libels that are, uh, of course, uh, an you know, a very obvious attempt to, to, to spread anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Um, and he's sentenced to two months in prison, but he is sort of celebrated by his uh, by, by by his fans when he's leaving court, 
Um, and what happens is that less than a year after he's convicted in 1929, then uh, in, in his hometown of Nuremberg, the Nazis massively increase their share of votes in, uh, in, in Nuremberg. And I think the worst thing is that the Nazis actually use the emergency uh, provision that is supposed to protect democracy in the Weimar constitution. They use that to mm -hmm. abolish uh, democracy by suspending free speech and freedom of association and so on, never to be, uh, never to be uh, revived again until, until the end uh, of, of, of Nazism and, and the new democratic uh, Germany. And I think that story is incredibly important when we think about whether we want to limit free, free speech, because I think, you know, free speech does come with harms and costs. Uh, I don't think you could organize a, a genocide. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, convince citizens to persecute Jews or uh, minorities without using speech. But the, pro the, the question is, is censorship and repression, is that a cure worse than the disease? And to me, history suggests that that is in fact the case. Well, well, that's interesting because it leads me to, you know, an, an important section of the book, which is about the, the chronicles of creation of the you know, post-war uh, uh, international human rights uh, law that sort of is the guiding principles for free speech and freedom of expression. And those of us like me who are in the freedom of expression world, you know, we can, uh, you know, uh, recite Article 19 uh, by heart. You know, everyone has the right. The freedom of opinion, and by the way, I'm not reciting this by heart, I'm reading it. Freedom of, uh, of, of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers. But Article 20, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which codified those rights in the Universal Declaration, is, is, is much more problematic. And, and you describe how you know, the, the role that the Soviet Union played and in, in, in helping to frame that. And they, I, they found a receptive audience in post-war Europe that had just, you know, um, uh, come, through, uh, come through the war and was deeply concerned about, you know, the, the totalitarian ideologies that were still, uh, you know, uh, uh, presented a, a risk in Europe and Article 20, requires that states prohibit propaganda for war and incitement to hatred and discrimination. You note that Eleanor Roosevelt, who led the U.S. delegation, warned that Article 20 would be used to restrict speech rather than protect it. And you argue that, that she was right. So here's my question, though. Uh, you know, can we, you know, have we reached some sort of accommodation with Article 20? Those, those of us who, like you, who you know, believe in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a positive uh, uh, or negative rights framework for, for free speech? Can, can we live with it? Or is it today, is that framework and, and that uh, article still a threat to freedom of expression in, in, your, in your mind? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I think <clears throat> you're right in, you know, the, the drafting history of, of, of that provision is deeply uh, problematic. And it's interesting when you look at the, the voting record, all sort of democracies at the time voted against it. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, in, in, initially rules of, uh, in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the attempt to, to, to introduce an, an obligation to prohibit hate speech was defeated. But then um, the Soviet Union and, and could, could appeal to, to, to recently decolonized states uh, who understandably were skeptical about uh, their former colonial masters uh, um, yeah, and, and, and wanted to see something done about racism having, having just been the subject of, 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 of racist colonial uh, uh, policies. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union tried to, to basically copy paste Article 123 of the 1936 Stalin Constitution uh, for, for, for the basis uh, of, of, of what they wanted in the, in, the new, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think the, um, you know, I, I think I, the ICCPR would be a better instrument without Article 20 for sure. However, I think it's interesting that, that 
um, the current interpretation of Article 20 provides, uh, in relationship with Article 19, provides a stronger protection of free speech than what follows under, for instance, the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, which, which doesn't include an explicit obligation to, to prevent uh, uh, hate speech. And I think th that has probably a lot to do with the fact that America has, 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 been, has been able to, to play a, a significant uh, role. Uh, but also, I think at the UN, there have been a lot of people who realize that unlike in, in unlike in Europe, you know, a lot of the member states are in, in fact authoritarian uh, states, and so if you allow Article Twenty to become very broad, then it will defeat the entire purpose uh, of of Article Nineteen. So luckily, we've had you know David Kay as uh, as the special rapporteur mm -hmm. on, uh, on 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 freedom of expression and opinion, who who did much to interpret uh, Article Twenty in a much more narrow sense, the same with the Human Rights Committee's general comment 34 from, mm -hmm. from 2011, which also sets up some very restrictive um, uh, conditions for when for when it can be used. Um, so in that, you know, that, that's the positive spin on, on, on Article 20. But mm -hmm. but certainly I would I would prefer <laughs> if, uh, you know, if like the Universal Declaration, there wasn't a, a, a specific obligation to prohibit. Um, mm -hmm. but, so, so aside from Article Twenty, I mean the the, the European framework for I mean, it obviously it varies, but in general, uh, in, in is is you know also um, arose in the context of this lingering concern about totalitarianism and the threat that it represented in Europe's own history. And so there are more restrictions generally in European or more uh, restrictions in European law generally on freedom of expression in the name of protecting vulnerable populations and in ensuring a media environment that's uh, tolerant and conducive to democracy. And this is often described as a, you know, a rights positive approach as opposed to the US First Amendment, which is grounded in, in, in individual liberty and not focused on, on outcomes. Um, do you think both of these approaches are kind of rights positive European um, um, approach and a rights negative, you know, US constitutional approach are, 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 are equally valid? Or do you have a preference? And if so, why? Yeah, um, I, I do have a, 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 a preference. And I think history provides a very good guide to which uh, which approach is the better if you are concerned about bro both the values of free speech and equal dignity, uh, which, which I think most people uh, that are uh, fans of, of, of liberal democracy uh, care about. So, so, so the European uh, approach is based on the idea that at a certain, at a certain level, uh, when 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 speech becomes extreme, free speech and equality and equal dignity are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I think the American experience shows the opposite. It's it it shows that free speech and equality uh, are mutually reinforcing. And and why do I say that? I, I say that because you know I, I think people tend to sort of forget that. Um, the civil rights movement, for instance, has was instrumental in developing uh, some of the very strong First Amendment protections uh, that characterize uh, uh, America. So it's not sort of a rugged individualism, you know, New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, which, which provides very strong protection for, for uh, American uh, media, for instance, when they report on, on, on public officials. Was a, was a civil rights case, um, uh, and, and I think we, we forget we forget that. Uh, but also, you know, when you go back further in American history, it become became very clear to me that that free speech, the principle and practice of free speech, was absolutely instrumental, especially when it comes to racial justice. Um, so so and and that censorship and repression 
was 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 a favored tool for the entrenchment of of white supremacy. So if you want to go to the to the 1830s, for instance, you had a campaign by anti-slavery uh, activists in the North sort of petitioning and writing pamphlets, sending them to the South, uh, arguing for, against slavery. And the response of Southern states was to adopt the most draconian speech restrictive laws yeah. in American history. So in, 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 in some states formally, you know, there was a death penalty for, 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 for spreading abolitionist ideas. You know, take, take, take a state like Virginia, um, so, you know, in June, 1776, Virginia becomes the first state to adopt a, a Bill of Rights uh, and including press freedom uh, as the bulwark of liberty, even before the Declaration of Independence. But then in 1836, Virginia adopts uh, a law which says that you are, you, you know, you cannot uh, spread the idea that that white masters don't have a right of property in their in their black slaves, or or, or you're not allowed to inculcate resistance. Uh, a, a, a against slavery, uh, you know, among many other things, a very detailed uh, bill. Um, and on the other hand, you have abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, um, who was born a slave, uh, of course, who understood very clearly that free speech was perhaps the most important weapon against slavery. Uh, so, so he argued that, that the right of speech is a very precious one, especially to the oppressed. And he writes what I think is still one of the most eloquent defenses of free speech called a, a, a plea for free speech in Boston. He writes that in 1860, after a number of white Bostonians had, had heckled and disrupted a meeting, an abolitionist meeting in, 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 in Boston. And he, and he gives a number of arguments that I think are, are, are sort of evergreen in, in favor of free right. speech. Um, and, and you also see that, you know, someone like Ida B. Wells, who, you know, uh, right. uses incredibly brave journalism to expose lynchings uh, in the South. Uh, and what happens, uh, you know, she's Southern newspapers incite violence against her. She has to flee. Her newspaper is burned down. Uh, and, and, you know, John Lewis, uh, the, the, the late congressman, said that without free speech and the First Amendment, um, the civil rights movement would have been a, a, a bird without wings. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently read a, um, uh, a kind of biography of Elijah Lovejoy, who was a, uh, a journalist uh, who uh, grew up in New England and moved to the frontier at the time to Missouri and founded an abolitionist uh, newspaper. And he was you know, murdered by a mob and the newspaper was destroyed because of his uh, uh, you know, his abolitionist writings. And I was surprised to understand uh, just, you know, the legal restrictions that he encountered in trying to advocate for, it was back in the 1830s and 40s, um, you know, and just how, how, how uh, what the legal regime was that uh, prevented uh, uh, that kind of discourse from, from reaching the public. Um, but I wanna like jump, jump, jump forward, um, into the present era uh, to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we face today. So, I mean, you describe many of them in your book. I think, you know, anyone who spends, you know, five minutes online uh, recognizes, um, you know, that they see governments pumping out propaganda, they see lies and, and, and misinformation spreading, you know, across uh, platforms. We see lots of silly arguments that fuel polarization. We see attacks and harassment intended to silence critical voices. And these, you know, and, and, and all of these together, you know, undermine democracy. We'll get to the kind of the conflict in Ukraine in a moment, but, you know, perhaps fuel the kind of, you know, uh, uh, polarization that leads to war. So governments and the international community, I think, are legitimately concerned about this kind of speech. So, you know, if a, if a if kind of censorship and restricting speech uh, is both wrong in your view, both for pragmatic reasons as a, as a matter of principle, you know, what are the tools that are available to try and create um, a speech environment that is uh, more conducive to, you know, uh, have, you know, defending rights and accountability, you know, is regulation on the table, are, are um, incentives, um, uh, you know, government investment, you know, what, and, and, and legal tools, what, what do you see as the array of legitimate tools that governments 
and, and international institutions can use to address these challenges? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good uh, question. I think, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that we're in a, a special moment in time uh, in the sense that, uh, that you, you know, we're in, 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 in a digital age, move, we've moved from an analog to, to a digital age, and that was all inevitably would give rise to a lot of disruption. Uh, you see that throughout history that, that whenever you have technological and political developments that expand the public sphere and gives voice to groups that previously were, were, were not part of the public sphere, it, it, gives, it gives rise to a lot of uncertainty uh, and disruption, and, and especially on the part of those who were sort of the institutional gatekeepers uh, and who had a privileged access to, to, to the public sphere. Now, um, and it's sort of a, a, a phenomenon which I've dubbed uh, elite panic in the book. Now, some of the concerns mm -hmm. uh, of elite panic are real and, and some of the di dilemmas are also real. Um, uh, but the problem, again, as, as, as with hate speech, is, is that very often you're, you're likely to adopt a cure that, that is worse uh, than the disease. But I think, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, obviously um, education uh, is, is, is incredibly uh, uh, important. I think um, my children are nine and 12. They're going to have, uh, you know, um, hopefully, I, I would say, going to, to be a, a, a lot better inoculated against some of the, uh, some of the ills of, uh, that, that, that are uh, abound on the internet than, uh, than, than, than generations that, that went before them, just because uh, they, they've grown up with it in, in, in a way uh, that we haven't. But I also actually think uh, that, you know, that we, we see developments all the time. I think you know, when I look at 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 at, at, at um, reporters like Bellingcat, for instance, um, what the, what they're able to do to sort of to document and expose um, the human rights violations of authoritarian regimes, the propaganda uh, and, and disinformation of, of of Putin's Russia, with with, with very few resources compared to to the billions of dollars that authoritarian states have at their disposal, I think that that charts a, a, a very promising uh, course. Uh, another another th uh, way forward, I think, is to, to adopt a more decentralized um, um, content moderate when it comes spe specifically to social media. So one where we don't sort of um, say, okay, these huge tech com uh, co uh, companies that have billions of users should adopt uh, these rules that are mandated by governments, uh, top-down centralized content moderation that, that will severely hurt uh, free, free speech uh, around the world and which will hurt the most um, probably people in, in authoritarian states that depend on, on social media to circumvent official propaganda and, and, and censorship. And then I think, you know, there's also a, a good argument to be said for, for for uh, social media platforms to voluntarily adopt human rights principles when it comes mm -hmm. to to content uh, moderation, um, and and but uh, you know uh, innovation uh, I, I think is taking place uh, every day, and 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 that I think will be will 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 be key to this. But I think you know having perspective is is, is very difficult in in an online environment where where policymakers. Are confronted with outrage and, and harms all the time, but but you know hopefully a historical look at, at free speech can can help us develop some some perspective and some resistance to sort of the knee jerk reaction to want to do something about something that might be serious and uh, problems, but that we may not solve and which may create right. even worse problems. So, so your advice to the elites is, is don't panic, rather than you know. Uh, look for uh, you know try try to solve this problem. Figure out what you what you can do because you may do uh, you know that's your, that's your you know there there are things that you think that can be done. But it sounds like the primary yeah. argument you're making is don't overreact, right? Yeah, I mean, but, that, that's yeah. yeah but, for, but no, I mean that's hard. That's hard for that for, is. But but, uh, but you know, you know, but, we're, but, we're, we're, you know those of us living through this moment to 
to uh, get our heads around, right? Sure, but if you you know if you were to go back to sort of uh, uh, World War One uh, and and at the same time you had sort of the the, the Russian Revolution uh, and a number of democracies, including the United States, you know, adopted draconian laws that you know you could go to prison for ten or twenty years for opposing uh, involvement in 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 America in in, in World War One in, in America, and you know if we were in the shoes of the this policymakers at the time, we would probably also be deeply worried, you know, um, uh, about uh, the potential of of the Russian Revolution to spread further, and you know, of 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 uh, you know, wartime. You know, whether you want to limit certain information during wartime. But you know, today, from the twenty first century, when we look at back at that, we see that as an absolute blot on the history of free speech in America and and and, and other countries. Right. And I think, you know, uh, so for instance, the European Union sort of overnight banning of Russian disinformation, uh, RT and Sputnik, I think we're likely to look back at it in the same light uh, as, as something that is not only well, undermining- well, well, why? why, why, well, let's go there. Why, why is that? I mean, you know, look, uh, RT and Sputnik are essentially state speech, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's this is this is the voice of the Russian state, yeah. and do, do states have uh, the same kind of rights? Uh, and uh, you know, it, it, and information is an, is an is an is an instrument of the conflict, right? So they are, and this conflict is illegal, and so they are. You know, I can understand the argument if it were against. Um, an independent Russian media outlet that was taking positions mm. that were supportive of the government, but this is the voice of the government. Why shouldn't uh, you know uh, Europeans take the steps they've taken to, even even if it's simply to send a message to Russia uh, that uh, you know that because there was also a re reciprocity, right? There was like we mm. tolerate this speech, and you let you know, a certain amount of independent journalism and you allow our correspondents to work in your country. So the tactical basis for allowing RT and Sputnik on the air, the Russians have taken that off the table, right? You know, there's no reciprocity yeah. even even in the, the, so so just let me hear your argument about why, um, and by the way, um, and this is where I'm, you know, adopting the posture of a contrarian, uh, but yeah, I'd, no, like, I, I'd like to I, push I, you a little bit on this. Yeah, no, I th and I think those are very, uh, I think those are very worthwhile, uh, worthwhile uh, questions. I think, first of all, with the idea of reciprocity, I don't think when it comes to free speech, democracies can't really <laughs> engage, you know, uh, the reciprocity argument isn't going to fly. I mean, then the authoritarians are always going to win, right? Uh, you know, um, uh, and 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 frankly, well, I the think Soviet that, Union. There, there was a, there was an exchange. They allowed their correspondence. Sure, and sure, but exchange, but but they're right? they, but they're never they're never going to to allow it to the same uh, to to the to mm -hmm. the same extent right. as, as as open democracy. So that's not a competition that you want to really engage in because then it becomes a regulatory race to mm -hmm. the bottom. I think. Um, and also, mm. I'm not concerned about the entity of RT, their right to free uh, speech, as much as I am worried about uh, one sort of the, 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 the other side of the coin, which is a, a free speech, which is maybe it's more communitarian value that of access to information across frontiers, which is, mm -hmm. which is also part of, of, of Article 19, for instance. So I right. think it's incredibly important that we're able to access um, information and and uh, by even by by uh, propaganda uh, outlets like RT uh, uh, and uh, and Sputnik, I think it gives us an insight uh, into uh, what they're thinking and how they're trying to curate uh, uh, reality. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, when when you look when you look at uh, attitudes in the West towards the Ukrainian conflict, no one can seriously argue that Russian propaganda has been efficient, uh, you know. Well, it hasn't been efficient in Europe and, and the US, but but no. it, it has been efficient in other parts of the world. Yeah, but but that's, um, that, that's not yeah. where they're banning it, right? So you're banning it in, right. in, the, Euro, in, in the European right. Union, where, you know, everyone right. has a, a blue and, and yellow flag on, on, their, on their avatar on, on social media. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, I also think that um, 
we can, you know, we can use um, our team Sputnik to debunk uh, uh, the uh, the information there. And then, of course, you know, if we st start getting into well, uh, the argument of well, states state sponsored media uh, can can you know we, we, they can be closed down um, f more freely than you know then you've made the argument for for the Russia to say well what about the BBC and Deutsche Welle well, and, uh, and right but I mean that that that's the tactical part that was always part of my calculation uh, but now it's off the table because there's nothing there's no there's no tactical. Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, but but and, and, and but I think they've used. I, I mean, they were probably mm. going to do it anyway. But but it gives them legitimacy right. the, the same way that, for instance, the 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 German law on on internet censorship, the Network Enforcement Act, has yeah, been yeah. Uh, has been explicitly referenced by by authoritarian states, including including right. Russia. They were likely yeah. going to do that anyway. But I don't think that liberal democracies should give that kind of. Uh, this thin veneer of legitimacy to 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 right. re restrictive policy, and I also just think you know, doesn't it show the supremacy uh, and in, and superiority of our system of governments that we are actually you know we have enough faith in in our populations and our own media environment that we don't need to ban uh, uh, Russian uh, propaganda, where, whereas in Russia they. The first thing they do is to scramble to, you know, put people in prison for 15 years for for, right. for using the wrong terminology. I could continue to talk about this. It's fascinating, but I want to I want to make sure we get to questions. And I have one more and then I'm going to turn it over to Holly. So folks uh, who are watching, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function and then uh, I'll uh, ask Holly to take it from here after this question. And uh uh, and hopefully we'll hear from some of the folks who are who are who are watching. So, I mean, you know, what's what's interesting is is you know this this whole debate that we're having, you know, that you chronicle that we're the topics we're discussing today. They, they they to my mind they inspire some uh, surprising passions. And I want to um, just ask you for your view of the latest, uh, you know, Tempest in a Teapot, which is about the New York Times. Um, free speech uh, editorial, which is getting uh, pilloried uh, by the Twitterati. Um, so, you know, and, and, and the credit, let me read it the, for the first, the first um, uh, uh, paragraph, which is what, you know, everyone's focused on, which, which the criticism is it really, you know, conflated a bunch of different, different ideas. So here's what, here's how the New York Times um, uh, began. Uh, it's uh, editorial uh, published over the weekend on free speech. It began, for all the tolerance and enlightenment in, that modern society claims, Americans are losing hold of a fundamental right as citizens of a free country, the right to speak their minds and voice their opinions in public without fear of being shamed or shunned. Agree? Yeah, I, yeah, it's 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 interesting because it. Um, uh, I I generally agree. I generally agree with the take of the New York Times, and and I thought that a lot of the criticism was 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 kind of bad faith, uh, and and very much revealed sort of this tendency of American parochialism uh, and, and and sort of uh, tunnel vision of, of of culture wars, where if you're on on one side of 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 the ideological debate, you you take one position inflexibly and 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 vice versa, um, because I think in uh, some of the criticism um, is based on this idea of of defining free speech as the First Amendment, so that that free speech is only about uh, you know government restriction of speech, which I think is fundamentally. Uh, a misunderstanding of, of free speech. I think that, in fact, I think ultimately free speech, um, for free speech to thrive depends on a culture of free speech and tolerance. So, so the, the First Amendment was adopted in 1791, uh, uh, but you know, 100 years ago, you could go to prison for 10 or 20 years for opposing uh, American involvement in World War I. Today, that would be uh, constitutionally protected. The wording hasn't changed. So what has changed? A culture of free speech and tolerance right. ha has changed. And so I think that um, 
uh, the the so the dirty word of ca cancel culture is a thing. Now, um, sometimes I think it's being abused, and and sometimes it's being used in a in a in a partisan manner by by certain grifters who who don't really care about free speech. But I don't, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you 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 know when you when you see the numbers of uh, professors and others, for instance. Who uh, who face consequences for something that they said uh, on uh, on Twitter? Uh, I I think I think it's fair to say that uh, that there's a, we're at a specific moment in American history where um, attitudes towards free speech uh, are are in flux, and I think there are, there's a lot of data that that also support supports it. That, that doesn't mean that Americans in general do not believe in free speech. I think it's more that um, partisan attitude shape tolerance uh, and intolerance, uh, and 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 then we prefer to define our intolerance as not being having anything to do with free speech because uh, we don't want to admit uh, that that we're, that we're in favor of of limiting free speech. Um, and but but and and you know. Um, uh, I think that basically these educational gag orders that are being adopted in a number of Republican states and the attempt to silence specific voices in cultural institutions and, 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 and campuses are more or less two sides of the same uh, illiberal coin. Okay, well, the New York Times, uh, I, I guess they, they probably should have spoken with you when they were drafting the uh, editorial, maybe it would help maybe, them uh, there, there, be a little more there, clear. There, there were certain uh, words that the uh, and, and sentences they could have drafted uh, more clearly, uh, yeah. so as not to provide uh, ammunition to, uh, to to those who were inevitably going to uh, be sniping at them. Fair enough, uh, Holly. Uh, do you want to jump in here with with your own questions or with some questions that have come from? Uh, People have tuned in. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions um, before we run out of time. And also on a, a recent article, it was uh, posted on Tech Policy Press. And on March 10th, they wrote that a group of multi-stakeholders from the internet governance community issued a joint statement calling on their colleagues to design sanctions that they believe uphold international human rights standards and with, that would be necessary and proportionate. So I think this is sort of in reference to concerns over war propaganda. They didn't mention Article 20, but it, that was sort of, I think, implied in this. And they specifically um, are, want a dialogue with their colleagues to determine whether IP addresses and domain names of the Russian military and its propaganda organs could and should be sanctioned. Um, but they want to see this dialogue as potentially creating some sort of precedent for potential future conflicts. I think that community is realizing that when these crises come, they're scrambling to figure out tools and responses. And so they're looking to establish some sort of policies as non-state actors to intervene and respond appropriately. And so I want to kind of ask you if your take on this is, is this just another step down the slippery slope or is this potentially a, a positive development? Yeah. Um, it would be really interesting if uh, if we had had uh, social media platforms that we have today during the Iraq War, uh, because then uh, a, a number, <laughs> uh, and and then if you were to, if you were to say that sort of propaganda against war as 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 uh, as prohibited by Article Twenty of of uh, Paragraph One of 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 the ICCPR uh, was to be applied, then. Then, then arguably the New York Times uh, sh uh, sh should have uh, been sanctioned. Um, but of course, you know, maybe it's a, it's a positive uh, thing to, 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 to at least uh, look at this through a, a um, uh, through, th through the, uh, the angle of, 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 of human rights. But again, I, I would urge, you know, you know, if you go back and look at the number of states and the identity of the states that have made reservations to Article 20, Paragraph 1, you will find that most of those are uh, liberal democracies who specifically worried about uh, free speech. So, so, so uh, 
uh, again, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of, of that provision and, and I don't see how it could be handled uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a clear and transparent and consistent manner. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so the other one I kind of want to get to your historical perspective on whether or not we really are at some sort of turning point in human history as we look at communications and um, I wanted to ask about how censorship has changed over time, particularly thinking about Tim Wu's argument where censorship now comes often in the form of a flooding of information. It comes as sort of troll armies, which uh, you know attack and harass. And is that distorting the marketplace of ideas to the point where counter speech and attempts to get out more and better speech um, is ineffective? And then I want to juxtapose that with what we're seeing now with Ukraine, where we had seen internationally sort of a fracturing of the the internet space geographically with Russia and then China and other countries trying to put up their own sort of iron curtains. But that now seems to be sort of solidifying. So are we moving back into sort of a a prior age? And is there a parallel there? Or um, do you think this this could be sort of a watershed for workarounds and and new forms of circumventing um, these types of state attempts to control the the flow of information? I think, you know, if if you, I think there are two ways you can look at it, the general trend. So, uh, you know, if you look at in, in, in the long term, you know, we're, we're in a golden age of free speech, you know, we've never had more opportunities to exercise uh, free speech. Free speech is a constitutionally protected, human rights protected uh, norm. Um, uh, and, and, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, people couldn't have imagined having the opportunities to speak across, uh, across frontiers uh, or access information, all the available information of, of the world uh, within seconds. But, you know, adopting a sh- more short-term view, I would argue that the golden age is in decline. Um, so mm-hmm. almost, you know, a number of institutions trying to measure that. And, you know, whether you look at press freedom, whether you look at the number of um, imprisoned journalists, uh, journalists killed, uh, um, um, internet freedom, all, all those are, are going in the wrong direction, suggesting that, that, that free speech is, is in decline and has been so for more than a, for more than a decade. Um, and what is driving it? I would still argue that that, <laughs> that all time um, government regulated censorship is, is 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 the biggest threat. You know, Tim Wu is a, is a great writer and and and, and has, has contributed immensely to 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 the debate about free speech. But I think he falls into the trap of taking sort of uh, you know taking the values of the First Amendment for granted, sort of saying that oh, it's like a I think in the metaphor he uses like it's like a, a fortress in the age of 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 of, of air warfare. But if you didn't have the First Amendment, uh, what kind of laws would have been adopted during the Trump presidency, for instance? You know, uh, Trump on numerous occasions very openly said that he would like to open up libel laws, that he would like to lock up opponents, uh, uh, and so on. So, so, so I think that's that's the danger of sort of taking the benefits of free speech for granted, and then uh, focusing with tunnel vision on the harms of, uh, of of free speech. And I don't think that in democracies, troll armies um, flooding the song with shit, to use the word of, of Steve Bannon, is as huge a problem as we once uh, thought. I, I think actually some of the panic that we saw after the 2016 presidential election, when you look at the, some of the the, uh, the the research and empirical data coming out of that, the picture is more nuanced and and less uh, alarmist than than what we thought uh, than we thought at the time. Um, on the other hand, I would say that some a country like China is perfecting the art of of, of censorship um, to a degree which is uh, and and that's where sort of troll armies might be really. Uh, um, effective in addition to old old fashioned uh, censorship and, and and surveillance because they, there's no real way to efficiently root around it in the way that that, that you could in in more open uh, democracies. But again, you know, uh, I'm I'm sure there are people 
sitting in a garage in Silicon Valley uh, working on uh, some 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 uh, great um, technical solution which will give us uh, opportunities uh, to to uh, to challenge uh, the the concerning developments and then uh, we just have to convince our policy uh, makers that uh, free speech is is worth standing up for and uh, maybe we'll be in a better place in a decade from now Oh, that's awesome. We want a little optimism to end the conversation. We've had too much gloom and doom recently. So I'd like to thank you both for an absolutely fascinating conversation. And um, I look forward to our, our next talk. Maybe we'll have a chance to uh, speak with Joel about, about his book coming up. And I do want to let everybody know in the audience that we have another event tomorrow and it is on violence against journalism in Europe. So we're going to be looking at recent case law and trends and developments in that space. And that the link to that's available on our website. So thank you guys again.